Welcome, everyone, to Designing a Course Syllabus. My name is Janet Giesen, and I am the Teaching and Learning Coordinator here in Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I want to wish all of you a Happy New Year to new and returning faculty and TAs and to our guests who have joined us from outside of NIU. I'm glad you've joined us today for this online workshop uh, that's going to last one hour. Some general guidelines before we get started. Uh, if you would like to say something uh, using your microphone, on the bottom part of your screen, you're going to see a little hand, as this icon shows here, and you can raise your hand and then click on your microphone button uh, to actually ask a question. But it's nice to have the hand raised so we don't over-talk one another. Also, please turn on your microphone uh, once you're acknowledged uh, so you can ask a question and then do turn it off when you are done so we don't hear outside noises like the bell that's ringing actually behind us right now. Uh, you are always welcome though to ask questions or to discuss via the uh, text chat and I'll try to address any questions that you might have uh, if you post something to the text chat area. So to get started uh, I created this workshop a while ago when it was really cold outside, so let's do a real quick icebreaker. How did you cope during the cold wave we just had the last two weeks during that sub-zero weather that we had? Uh, say something in the chat area about how you actually coped during that really cold wave that we had. Dan, yes, you uh, dressed in lots of layers. Hot tea, yes. Mostly stayed inside. Uh, Netflix and hot chocolate, movies and sweaters, stay indoors, excellent. I was actually uh, babysitting my neighbor's chickens, so I had to go outside quite a bit and take care of them. Wonderful. Thanks, Hannah, sending warmth your way. Actually, we don't really need it too much today because it's actually, actually pretty balmy compared to what we've been having. So great, that was a quick icebreaker. As with uh, a course syllabus, having some sort of objectives uh, keeps us focused and aware of where we're going uh, in today's workshop. So by the end of today's workshop, hopefully you'll be able to describe the purpose of a syllabus, identify some components of a syllabus. We'll talk a little bit about aligning course components and how you could do that in a syllabus. We're also going to be addressing accommodations and accessibility issues. And then we're going to talk briefly about how you can create a syllabus that has more of a learner center focus rather than a teacher center focus. And then at the end, we're going to be talking about how you can actually design uh, a syllabus that looks nice, that is aesthetically pleasing, um, instead of the typical syllabus that just takes up a lot of space on the page. So most likely, your syllabus is going to be one of the first substantial means of communication between you and your students. So the ultimate goal then of a well-designed syllabus is going to ensure students understand what's expected of them throughout the semester. So that way then the syllabus should be easy to read and understand and follow just like a map. So think of the syllabus as a road map. Uh, for you and your students that you can follow as you navigate throughout the semester. The syllabus then is really a primary source of information to help guide your students throughout the semester and should carefully explain the course components as a map would do. The syllabus then acts as your teaching outline as well. And I always recommend when you teach a class that you keep your syllabus close at hand even when you're teaching. So if you try something um, that's on your syllabus and it doesn't work, you can make a note by it and so on. So keep your syllabus at hand when you're teaching so you can use it as a reference point later on. Not only is your syllabus a roadmap that defines the structure of your course, it also serves a number of other purposes. And you'll see five of them here. And we're going to be discussing each of these individually.
So the syllabus acts as a planning document for you and for your students. So think about when you teach a course that you could, as I just mentioned, review the notes the last time you taught the course and you could put that on your syllabus so it can help plan for the next time you teach the course. You can also use feedback that you receive from students and you put that on your syllabus uh, and then refer to it as you're planning for the next semester. It also helps you plan the course by checking that your goals and your activities and all of your assessments are aligned. And then some of you, especially students and TAs who are teaching a course, are often given a syllabus that has already been prepared and planned. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't take it and make it something of your own. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And then as far as a planning document for your students, obviously the syllabus helps them plan their semester. Um, each of them has a syllabus from each of the courses. Uh, they can look at the assignments that are due when um, papers are due, and they can plan their semester around each of the other courses. Students can then, the syllabus can also help students manage their study time depending on when uh, assessments are due. And you might include information on your syllabus of what they need to study for an exam or quizzes, how to um, include certain information for the assessments for the things that you are actually having them do during the semester. So the syllabus first acts as a planning document. The second purpose then of a course syllabus is as a central reference and communication tool between you and your students. And then everybody refers to this throughout the semester. So you're going to use your syllabus to provide the details that students have mentioned in previous semesters, such as maybe specifics about an assignment, where to get writing support, and so on. I can't overemphasize the importance, though, of using clear and precise language when you write your syllabus. There's nothing worse than for students to find typos on, on your syllabus. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But you really want to make sure that this central reference tool um, is free of typos and uses clear and precise language. That way it can help reduce students' misunderstandings and frustrations and surprises that might happen throughout the semester. The third purpose of a course syllabus is that it's an agreement. Now there's a lot of discussion out there that talks about a syllabus as being a contract. And even though a syllabus is not a legal contract that's signed between you and your students. Um, I've done some uh, review of the literature and in a review of the legal precedents they say that syllabi are really not considered contracts because the courts refuse so far to recognize educational malpractice or breach of contract as a cause of action. And that's some legalese that talks about the courts really don't consider a syllabus as a legal binding contract. So let's think of the syllabus then as an agreement between you and your students. Think of it as a fluid document. Maybe you could consider it as an operator's manual, which maybe can be updated and amended during the semester. Um, and then if a student were to find a loophole, all you can do really is to honor that loophole and then make sure that that loophole is removed the next time you teach the course. But as an agreement, the syllabus lists the expectations. What is going to occur? And it talks really about responsibilities. And it's there's nothing that says that you can't put in the syllabus the responsibilities of students as well as the responsibilities of you as an instructor. Obviously, you're going to be listing, listing course policies and procedures, uh, students are very interested in those, um, and then also, as well as the details of the course. But you might want to include the statement again about your responsibilities, and you could say something like, if I promise to come to class on time with an organized and engaging lecture, uh, using meaningful and different activities and assessments, then I'd like you, the students, to do the same come to class on time, be prepared to be engaged with one another, do your very best. And then you could finalize that statement and say, are we in agreement with this? And by doing so, you're going to get students involved in the class 
and then they're going to be most likely interested in, in the course as well. So consider the syllabus as an agreement. You want to make sure that it uh, states all the rules, the policies, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And it definitely should set forth what's expected to happen during the semester in an organized and meaningful way. So most importantly, though, your course syllabus should convey a number of concepts that are of, of particular important importance to both you and your students and include all those details that make the course actually what it is. The fourth purpose of a course syllabus is that it's really a teaching and learning tool. It's a teaching tool which is related to you as the instructor. You're going to explain the relevance and importance of certain content. You will provide strategies uh, for students to be successful in your class. Uh, you're going to describe your availability. Um, and then you should also list on your syllabus campus and other resources that will help students become successful in your class. And not only your class, but as well as other courses. So then as a learning tool uh, for your students, obviously your course is going to list the requirements and policies, but also maybe list students' responsibilities, you know, ways to plan and self-manage their learning. Um, the, resources that you provide explain how students can actually use those resources to their best advantage. So a syllabus can provide information to help you stu your students become more effective learners. Um, you can also provide, let's say, estimates of maybe student workload, hints for how to study, hints for how to take notes, manage time, um, and also providing information such as resources for tutoring, writing, uh, counseling to help students succeed in your courses. So the items that you put in your syllabus as this teaching and learning tool definitely can greatly improve students' ability to learn the material that you're teaching them. The fifth purpose then of a course syllabus is that it becomes a permanent record of your course being offered and not only offered but taught. Uh, this can help students who are searching for such a course in the future, and it can also tell them something about you and how you teach, teach the course. This is especially helpful if you teach a course that has multiple sections. Um, the syllabus can also help future faculty and TA who might teach this course um, and need the syllabus as a basic reference point. So the course information uh, that we'll talk about in a minute really it would be the resources and the technology requirements, the textbook and materials, and so on. But the syllabus then also serves as an accountability and documentation function. Uh, so it contains information useful for um, evaluation of instructors and TAs, evaluation of courses and programs. Uh, it can also be useful in course equivalency transfer situations uh, where students are coming in with transfer uh, coursework. Also for accreditation purposes, faculty reviews, and articulation. So you have this permanent record on file, and most departments today require faculty to provide them a copy of the course syllabus so they have it on file. Now we're going to move into what I call the nuts and bolts or the guts of your uh, syllabus. This is the course uh, syllabus components. Uh, I also provided for you uh, in the emails that I sent to you a checklist. And if you made a copy of that or opened that up on your computer, you can use that to follow along as we go through the next few slides. And you might want to be thinking about the course components as they're laid out on that checklist and whether or not you want to keep them in that particular order or if you want to put them in another order. There is no hard and fast rule that says you have to include one component before another but it's more logical, let's say, to include contact information more toward the front of the syllabus than it is at the back. At this point, I'm going to pause real quickly and ask if there are any questions before we move on to this particular section. OK, let's move forward. Before you start working on a syllabus or before you start reviewing it and making amends to it, you really should need to know or, or you should know the specific requirements put forth by your department or your school or your college. 
So some of them have specific grading policies or policies about attendance and makeup work or whether or not they even allow makeup exams. So ask someone in your department whether there are any rule, rules or hard and fast uh, policies that, that certain material must be included in a course syllabus. This is especially helpful if you teach a multiple section course because you want all of those courses to have at least similar information that's being taught and conveyed, but that doesn't mean that you can't make the course your own by the way you actually teach it. So do check with your department or school or college if there are any absolute requirements of material or information that must be in the uh, course syllabus that you're teaching. Course information. This is really important because you want your students to know who you are, where you're located, and so on. So I've listed some items here, the course designator and number, the section number. Uh, years ago when I used to advise students, uh, I had a student who didn't even really know the name of their instructor. So it does help to put information uh, up front on your syllabus of who you are, where you can be located. So course description, la uh, classroom location, and all these different areas and items that might help students uh, function in the class. So this is just a uh, table of information that I included on a, a course that I taught last spring. And you can see I put it in a table format to make it easier to follow. So my name, my office, my phone number, office hours, it was an online course. So obviously by appointment, most students were not on campus and this kind of information. So make sure this is inf information that is uh, more toward the front of the syllabus. Then you want to have specific information about you. Uh, a picture helps. Um, if you have a TA, that's great. Include their information as well on the syllabus. If you have a title and you want to be called by that title, also convey to your students how you want to be uh, referred to. Um, there's nothing worse than someone who really wants to be called doctor or professor and have students in an email say, hey, you. Um, so uh, do put that information down on your syllabus. Your phone number is important, your email address. Uh, unfortunately, I know that some departments have gone away with having phones available for faculty, but provide as many ways as possible that your students can get in touch with you, um, even if you have special office hours on campus for even an online course. Your preferred method of contact is email your preferred me method of contact. Uh, phone calls sometimes are very difficult to return. You can play phone tag for quite a while. Um, but any way that you can provide ways for your students to contact you, um, so much the better. If you've got a website or a blog, maybe you have special meetings in a classroom on Fridays, uh, whether or not you have virtual meetings uh, for an online class. Um, but I did want to mention something about your email address and, and an email policy. I had um, been teaching for quite a while and I developed a policy that said something to the effect that I'll try my hardest to answer email messages within 24 hours Monday through Friday, but may not be able to answer email on weekends. So the message might need to be modified as you, if you teach an online class, that's especially because students uh, figure an online class is available 24 seven, they may expect the same from you, but just make sure that you are explicit about how students can actually contact you. This is an area that you don't have to include in your syllabus, but I think it's really nice to let your students know. What are your methods for teaching and learning? Include somewhere on your syllabus, wow, what kind of methods and strategies are you using to teach? Maybe provide details about course activities and assignments. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about aligning your methods, your teaching methods with your goals and your learning objectives. But you also might consider including a teaching philosophy. And it could be as simple as, I love to teach. And you could put that somewhere on your syllabus. But you do want to um, make sure that your students uh, feel comfortable with what you're teaching. Uh, by putting this information on your syllabus, it can also put students' mind at ease if you describe why you've selected 
specific teaching strategies, as well as the reason why they're being asked to complete certain activities and assignments that you've selected. Uh, about that uh, teaching philosophy, write one that conveys your enthusiasm for teaching and your enthusiasm for your subject. Explain maybe the importance and benefits of why students should take the course. If it's a gen ed course, we know that a lot of students are taking it because they have to. But turn it around in another way and explain maybe the real benefits of taking this class beyond getting a letter grade. So if you add a positive and optimistic teaching philosophy statement to your syllabus, it can really send an important message to your students of your love for your subject and that you're really interested in their success in your course. So I just um, actually came across a, an article in Faculty Focus this morning. They were talking about the tone of a class. Um, and they were saying, students want to be taught by a professor, but a person who acts like a person. So that's kind of the, the, the gist of, of a teaching philosophy. Goals and learning objectives really are the heart of your instruction and they should be very carefully written. Course goals and objectives uh, tend to represent what students should be able to do successfully after completing certain parts of the class and what they should be able to do by the end of the course. These goals and objectives should be observable and measurable and be stated in terms of student outcomes, the things that you're asking them to do. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to plan these activities and assignments and outcomes that helps students achieve those goals and objectives. So you don't want to just select activities and assignments just because you think they're cool. You want to make sure that you plan these assignments and activities uh, that are aligned with the course goals. And they tend to be located more toward the front of the syllabus. Uh, goals, in essence, are broad statements of intent, as though the students will learn how to do this. And then objectives describe a discrete observable task. And then that becomes a much more definitive and uh, descriptive type of um, expectation. You do want to make sure goals and objectives are attainable. So look at your syllabus right now and look at the goals and objectives that are listed on it and ask yourself, are these being met? And if they aren't, figure out how they can be met or maybe remove, remove them and add some new ones or change them up a little bit. But do explain the relevance of these goals and objectives to your students. Uh, and then it definitely can show how they link to professional standards that help drive your curriculum. Course requirements. Um, and again, the titles or the headings that you see on that checklist and the titles uh, and headings you see here aren't ones that you have to hold true to, but you want to have something that students can easily look at and then find information in a fairly quick manner. But your course requirements tend to be the listing of readings and assignments, projects, quizzes, exams, final presentations, and so on. Those are the things that you're expecting students to do. Uh, course requirements can also help uh, describe what class participation is. Some students think that class participation occurs by them just being present in class but not speaking. So you might want to have a further description of what class partition participation actually means. Uh, course requirements also would include due dates and specific times when they're due. And related to that, especially if you have students turning in submitting assignments in Blackboard, um, if you have a time, uh, it's nice to actually actually put the a.m. and p.m. on it. So if you say 11.59 p.m., that means midnight rather than 11.59 at noon. And then also describe any labs, studios, recitations, um, any extraneous uh, areas of bits of information where students need to be in addition to attending your class in a specific classroom. You also might want to consider uh, making available um, projects and assignments from previous semesters uh, for your students. If you teach in a 100% online class, um, you would have to get permission in order to post that for all students to look at. You definitely would take names off of. But it's nice to have something that students can look at for them to get an idea of what those expectations are. 
course assessment and grading. This always gets a bad rap. Um, you know, it would be really nice if we could just discuss a letter grade, a final grade for a student rather than giving them marks, but we know that many students are driven by letter grades. But you do want to provide a list of standards and uh, um, criteria for each graded course requirement, whether that's an assignment, a project, an exam, whether it's class participation, so students know what your expectations are and how they should proceed to actually complete them. You want to state how much each graded course activity is going to count toward the final course grade. You're going to also include the course grading scale so students can keep track of their progress. And related to that, as a side, make sure you return graded work quickly to your students so they are clear on where they stand uh, as the semester progresses. You're going to state how students are going to be rewarded for effort. Uh, rubrics help that. Uh, and progress. And if you allow extra credit, uh, you do not have to allow extra credit. Um, you have to determine whether or not you will actually allow that to happen in your class. Um, but you want to really be also um, specific about how final grades are going to be determined, especially if that extra credit is worked in. Um, and you also want to let your students know whether you weight letter grades, whether you use you know, fully accumulated points, or if you're going to grade on a curve. Finally, related to this area is this uh, concept of incomplete grades. Some students uh, are almost uh, determined that they should be given an incomplete grade without much question. But it's strictly up to you and also your department if an incomplete grade is allowable. But you, if you do give incomplete grades, you want to make sure that you describe the process and the possible consequences uh, for issuing an incomplete grade. Um, so for example, if you issue an incomplete grade to a student, you can tell them that no matter where your letter grade stand, which was at at the time the incomplete grade was given, with the incomplete grade being processed, you will receive one letter grade lower than you would have gotten without the incomplete. That's a policy that you could determine if, if you wanted with your students. Another area or component would be course resources. And this is really important because students want to know where they can get the textbooks or course packs uh, or if material is on e-reserve. Um, list any kind of technology, equipment needs, whether or not you're going to be using clickers or student response systems, personal response systems. You'd want to also list the resources, not specific to the course per se, but support services that help students become better students. So support services such as the Disability Resource Center or the Counseling and Consultation Services, uh, NIU Writing Center. There are some faculty that require their students to submit draft work of assignments for their courses to the Writing Center before they submitted it as a final grade. And also maybe if there's some peer tutoring opportunities available. There are also, or you should be looking for free open access textbooks or open education resources that often include illustrations and images and co of concepts, exercises, quiz questions. And there's a growing repository of these OER resources. Um, but many online courses are um, lucky enough to have some of these open resources um, that are uh, free and open access where students don't have to pay for them at all. Again, today in Faculty Focus, they talked about course policies. And we tend to get caught up in what I would call course policy creep, or course policy legalese, or course policy challenges, uh, because we often think that this syllabus has to be so definitive and have every policy listed. Um, but you want to make sure that it, whatever policies you instill in your courses, make sure that they're clear and succinct. And that if you have course policies, that you hold to them. So course policies could be related to attendance, whether or not students arrive late or, or leave early, um, course policies about late work, missed work, exams, and, and, and so on. You could even have course policies about dress code, depending on what kind of class you're teaching. 
Uh, I know there were students who were working in a child development lab and they couldn't have long fingernails because they were working with young children. Whether or not you're working with materials, uh, safety in labs, uh, and maybe uh, physical education areas where students are helping each other, spotting them for doing certain kinds of um, moves and dancing as well. Uh, university property and so on. Also, course policies about comportment, such as being civil in class, respecting everyone, cell phones. Um, it's a huge issue. It could be a workshop in itself, whether or not you allow students to use cell phones in class and so on. So there are many, many different types of policies that you're going to be considering. But when you write the policy, um, sometimes the course policies send a message that our courses really are more about rules and edicts and regulations and less about teaching and learning. So try to soften up the language a little bit. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but just try to make it sound less demanding and more that you're working with the students. So provide that succinct information. And um, finally, realize it's easier to pull back on course policies than it is to add them as a semester progresses. So think about all the policies that you want to include, reword them so they come off sounding a little more positive minded rather than negative, um, and add as many as you need, um, but also remove the ones that you don't think would be absolutely necessary. Academic integrity is another area um, or section that you want to put somewhere in your syllabus. Make it prominent. You might want to include a university plagiarism statement um, and conduct and a discipline regulation statement. You can find those statements at these websites that I have listed here. And I like to call this section, instead of calling, calling it academic dishonesty, I like to refer to it as academic integrity. So again, it has a positive spin rather than immediate a negative type of uh, connotation as students read it. Another section that tends to be at the end of the syllabus is a course calendar or schedule, but it doesn't always have to be at the end. Um, I prefer to put it in a table format that looks something like this. It's easier to find information. However, we have to also realize that these types of tables, if you use them, any kind of even images, uh, might not be accessible by screen readers. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But do provide a list of topics, readings associated with the topics, assignments, and due dates. Try to sequence it in a logical way, obviously by week. And you can do this very easily in Blackboard using folders. And you can create a folder per week, and then in each folder have information that's relevant to that week. Um, you can definitely include a subject to change statement in your syllabus. And sometimes changes do occur. However, keep in mind that here at NIU, there is this rule that says changes after the fourth week of class especially if they're substantial, can be basis for grade appeal. So you can include a statement that says the syllabus is subject to change, but do make sure that those changes aren't too substantial. Um, you don't want to be changing dates that much because students plan their semesters around the dates that you put in the syllabus as it's originally uh, written. Um, but do remember that caveat. After the fourth week, if you make substantial changes, a student could actually take you to task on that and be a basis for grade appeal. Okay, now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about aligning course components. And this is a good time again to pause and ask if any of you have any questions so far. You can uh, type them directly into the chat area, or you can raise your hand and turn on your microphone. Okay, good. I created this Venn diagram that um, kind of shows you one of the characteristics of best practices in teaching to align your learning objectives, your assessments, and instructional activities so that they reinforce one another. So in order to do this, 
uh, to ensure the three components do align, you might want to ask yourself some questions about your learning objectives. What do you want your students to know how to do when they leave this course? That's a basic learning objective. What do you want your students to know at the end of the semester? Related to assessments, you want to ask yourself the question, what kinds of tasks will reveal whether the students have achieved the learning objectives? You can see how they're tied together then. And then you ask yourself, what kinds of activities in and out of class will reinforce the learning objectives and prepare students to do the assessments? So you can see how they really are tied together and how they are aligned. So you don't start with the instructional activities first when you're building a course. You start with the learning objectives. Then you develop your assessments. Then you develop your learning activities. So addressing the questions that I just asked can help you design a course syllabus that's organized in such a way that all of these components that we talked about are aligned and are meaningful. What I've done here is taken three screen captures. Um, I took the objectives from a class that I was teaching. I took the uh, section of the module five, and then I took another section of module five, the discussion section. So these are all separate screen captures. But you're going to notice at the end of each of these objectives, you'll see the CO3. And what is that is saying that objective number one, explore use of digital media and instructional resources for learning, is aligned with the course objective number three. And then for the module five quiz, talks about after completing the, write, the, the readings and viewing the media, take the quiz. And you're going to see that these then, the, the quiz itself, it's aligned to the module objective 5.1 and the course objective number three. Now, aligning course content and assessment to standards and goals does tend to make it easier to demonstrate how the course meets those standards and goals and how the performance that the students are demonstrating measures up to them. So students might not appreciate that this information is on the syllabus, especially with this, and I would definitely explain what it means if you do include it. But doing so can show them that all parts of the course have been really planned well uh, to make it a meaningful progression of activities. Also, showing these alignments or having them show up on your syllabus um, uh, can be an excellent reference for program reviews uh, and future course development. So this is something to consider. And more and more departments are asking faculty to show this alignment in one way or another. And this is a great way to actually do that. This is a good time to ask again if you have any questions. And the section that we're going to be going into now is talking about accommodations and accessibility. And whether you teach a fully face-to-face -face course, a fully online course, or a blended course, you should really address accessibility issues in your course syllabus. So I'm going to give you just a really brief introduction of, uh, to syllabus accessibility. So you'll have this information to consider uh, at this time as you prepare and finalize your spring syllabus. Um, and I provided a lot of resources at the end of this PowerPoint presentation for you to access uh, about accommodations and accessibility. So the NIU campus welcomes all students and is really committed to providing a range of specific student needs and accommodations. Uh, whether you know it or not, the US Department of Education and the Higher Learning Commission requires that all courses have a syllabus and that syllabus needs to be made available to each student enrolled in that course by the first class meeting. At minimum, regarding student accommodations, all syllabi, at least here at NIU, must include an Americans with Disabilities statement. With the ADA statement, you can also add a statement requesting that students with disabilities contact you regarding accommodation needs. So you would never 
in front of all the other students, ask who needs accommodations. But you can put the information in a prominent location in your syllabus and asking students if they have some sort of special need uh, or accommodations to contact you. So there are other ways NIU accommodates its students, as you can see um, with, with these statements. These are all different kinds of statements and services on campus. And the one statement that I've included in my syllabus is something like, um, um, just think how it goes, okay. If you have any kind of a circumstance or, or issue that might have some impact on your work in this class and for which you might require some sort of special accommodation, contact me, the instructor, early in the semester so those accommodations can be made in a timely manner. What that's saying is you don't want students to wait until the very end of the semester to tell you that they have some sort of an issue uh, that could have been accommodated earlier in the semester. There are other statements to consider including on your course syllabus, including these inclusive statements for syllabi. The uh, NIU Office of Ag Academic Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion has established uh, a faculty a toolkit. This is online where you're going to find a range of inclusive statements recommended to be included in course syllabus. Now, you don't have to include all of these. You, by NIU edict, you do have to have the ADA statement, but you might want to consider including these as well. The toolkit also provides resources to help navigate classroom dynamics um, and also to create culturally responsive teaching. So it's a great resource that you can have. Uh, the toolkit is located at this URL that you see on the screen. Although not absolutely required to be included on the syllabus other than that ADA statement, including these statements can help provide a more dynamic educational experience that expands the understanding of difference in cultures and identities, and then respects the rich and diverse cultures uh, that's represented here on the NIU campus. And I'm sure that would be the same for any of you who are from campuses outside of NIU. Making your student, your syllabus accessible. You need to be thinking about all the students who take your course. All of your students um, are not, may not have good vision. All of your students may not have good hearing. Uh, so you want to make sure that your syllabus itself is accessible. So accessibility really means sh uh, making sure that your content is available to as many people as possible. And that's especially for those individuals who have hearing, visual, and cognitive impairments, um, many of them who often use some sort of assistive technology to access materials in your course. So whether or not you use Word documents or PDFs, uh, PowerPoint presentations, whether information is on the web, or the students use mobile devices, all the content that makes up your course needs to be accessible. Now, this is an, it could be an entirely different workshop for an hour or longer. But I wanted to make you aware of that as you're putting together your syllabus um, so you consider some of the following, some of these instructional design principles. Thinking about the reading order um, of how an actual uh, screen reader would look at a document and read it back to a student. Heading styles and table headings. Um, using alternative text for images. If you have an image file in your syllabus, it alone is not accessible by a screen reader. It has to have some sort of an alternate text that the screen reader will tell the person looking at it um, or viewing it uh, what the actual image is. You want to be thinking about making sure that your syllabus is uh, simple enough as far as layout and thinking about color contrast if you use color. So you definitely can fix non-accessible documents to make them accessible. And you can use a couple tools. There is the accessibility checker in Adobe Acrobat uh, Pro. And then there's also the accessibility checker utility in Microsoft Word. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that at, at this time. But I do have more resources for you available at the end of this PowerPoint. 
Um, but you do want to just make sure that all of the content in your course, whether it's online, whether it's being viewed mobily, whether it's being viewed in class or at home, all of it has to have some sort of accessibility um, built into it. So as far as this workflow shows, if you have a Word file, you can edit the modifications and then create a PDF file. But you want to be considering the headings, the images, and creating an alternate text to that alternative text, and then um, any hyperlinks that you might have. So this is another folder or a resource, this URL here, that you can um, access that really does an excellent job in explaining how to do this. It's a tutorial. It's a, almost four hours long, but it's in sections that you can look at um, in different parts. Um, but I would highly recommend looking at this as a resource to help you create accessible files for your class and for your syllabus. So far, any questions? We've got about 15 minutes to go. All right, I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but um, hopefully you'll be able to take away some things that will help you prepare a syllabus that's really good for this um, coming semester. I wanted to talk now about creating a learner-centered syllabus. And when we talk about learner-centered, we're talking about even a course that is focusing on the student rather than so much around the teacher. So really, the syllabus itself, to be learner-centered, all you'd have to do is really change the tone of the language that you include in your syllabus. So you want to know who your students are. Yeah, obviously know who you are, and you've done that through your teaching philosophy. So you define your students' responsibilities. You establish meaningful assessments and procedures. And you can see that all of this is focusing on the student and their success, providing clear goals and outcomes, and also explaining what your responsibilities are as well. And I have mentioned that earlier. So as far as the language goes, what you can do is use the pronouns you and I rather than the student and the instructor. And that can help make the syllabus more inviting. Using the instructor and the student sounds um, more like an edict or a contract um, and less like an invitation to learn. So other ways to create a learner-centered syllabus would be to include information that establishes inclusiveness, invites participation, honors diversity and differing points of view. Um, acquainting students with course logistics, as we've been discussing. Uh, supporting student learning resources, having those available for students that help them be successful students, not just in your class, but other classes. Providing a rationale for those learning objectives. Why did you write them? Why are they there? How are they helping students learn your content? Including warnings of potential pitfalls. Uh, in the past, you may have noticed that students are having difficulty with certain course content. How can you help the current students maybe um, be more successful in learning this difficult information? And then also by providing recommendations for students staying on track through the various resources that are available on campus. So what I've, there's a lot of words on this and we don't have to read all of it, but to create a personalized course description. All courses have a formal catalog course description. So for example, this is an Econ 102 course. I believe it was taken from another uh, uh, university. So it's very basic. It's very succinct. But it doesn't really excite the students a whole lot. So in addition to including the course catalog description, go ahead and write a personalized course description. So this faculty member said, why should you want to study microeconomics? Again, it would be a gen ed type course. And I believe it's a woman. She said, every choice you make from what time to get up, whether or not to go to class, how long to study or work, or how much to eat, whether to go on Thursday nights, all of it incorporates, incorporates microeconomic principles. So you can see that you could take basic life skills, life things that are happening to students, and turn it into a description based on your course content. And then notice the uh, last sentence. I love this course. And I'm hoping by the end of the semester, you'll be able to develop a deep appreciation for this subject as well. So you can see that this, 
faculty member is really interested in helping them learn about microeconomics and sharing their love of their uh, subject with them. For the last part of the workshop, what I'd like to do is show you or provide for you some information on how you can kind of jazz up your syllabus a little bit, change the visual appeal, maybe change the aesthetics of the syllabus. Now, some of you might be looking at a course syllabus right now, and I imagine that some of you are looking at a document that is all words, that there aren't any images, no diagrams, maybe not even any tables. So we'll show you some examples of how you can actually change this up. First of all, ask yourself, what does your syllabus say about you and your course? Again, going back to that, maybe that personalized course description. What information or format is required? What course policies are essential when information can be chunked? Maybe there's a lot of information that can be kind of gathered together and put under one heading. Maybe you could take information out of the paper course syllabus or the printed course syllabus and move it to Blackboard or another format. So that's kind of considering doing a syllabus makeover. For example, this is a class that I taught back in spring 2011. Um, doesn't look too unlike other course syllabus syllabi, but I did include a computer image just because the course is called Computers in Education. So I thought, well, why don't I throw in at least something that maybe might gather um, students' attention. Same information at the front end. Here's that statement about responding to email. But what's different about this syllabus is that at the very top, I've included some links that almost functions as though it's a website. So if a student were to look at the syllabus in Blackboard or online on a computer, they could go over any of these sections and click on it and it would take them directly to that section of your syllabus. So it makes it a little more interactive. This is the same syllabus. I've divided major information by a red line just to include a little color. Um, major headings. This is the regular course description. But at the bottom of the page, I also included some of those links, those internal links that would take them directly to either Blackboard or the top of the page or um, another area that was required of the course at that time. This is a table that I put together about the course outcomes in, the, in that particular class. Uh, I divided the exams, separated them from the projects, definitely had the dates, the point structure. For this class, I allowed students to take either a comprehensive final exam or to complete a comprehensive final project. I gave them that choice. Again, made it a little more learner-centered. Now. If someone is colorblind, they might not be able to see these colors. Also, we would have to think about the accessibility of this and a screen reader being able to read this. Uh, it probably does not match that. We'd have to run it through one of those checkers to see if a screen reader could indeed read this information back to uh, a person using that device. Here's another example uh, from an engineering course that is a cover page to a syllabus. So what happened is that the instructor kind of developed the syllabus in a little booklet format. Here's a welcome statement. There was a table of contents. And then here would be the accommodations, tips and, uh, and tips for success. So just a different type of syllabus, a different way of presenting information. And what's nice about it, because you're not printing syllabi anymore, you can make these as complex and um, uh, long as possible as you want, because it's all electronic. Students don't even have to print them out. This is another example. It's kind of um, busy, I would say, from Kansas State University. Uh, the class is of the fundamentals of visual literacy, so there are a lot of visuals included. I would say this would be very difficult for a screen reader to read this information back to a student. But again, it just shows you that you can include images. Um, over on the right-hand side is from another syllabus. Uh, it was an anatomy physiology course, and the instructor decided to include a spinal column uh, uh, image of that. But again, that would have to be, 
include alternate text if it were to be accessible. So you can see that you know you can change up your syllabus to make it a little more exciting for your students and for you. As a final check before you share the syllabus, before you share it in class, before you share it online, make sure you review it for clarity, change up the tone a little bit, maybe have someone read it. Have someone who doesn't even know anything about the class read it. Have a roommate, have a significant other, have a colleague read it, and, and give, have them give you some feedback about how they think the syllabus is actually going to be uh, accepted by anybody who uses it as a, a document for their class. Definitely fix your um, typos, make it accessible, use one of those uh, tools to see if it is indeed accessible the way it is. Do check your calendar dates against exams that you have, assignments that are due. Um, get yourself a calendar with holidays and try not to schedule maybe big assignments due around certain holidays. Uh, make sure that calendar is correct or accurate. I, I had a calendar last year that didn't have 31 days in July. Um, it was kind of strange, but um, nonetheless, make sure that the, uh, the calendar is correct. And then also consider university events. I was teaching a Saturday class. It was a six hour course um, and in the fall semester. And I decided not to have the class it was a face-to-face -face class on um, the weekend of homecoming because I figured that students, because it was an undergrad course, would be attending homecoming activities. So just something to be thinking about. But do do a final check before sharing your syllabus. In the PowerPoint presentation, you will see some of the resources uh, in red. And those are the ones I find especially helpful um, as you prepare a syllabus. This is the one about a learner-centered approach, and it's a video. And uh, faculty focus, what does your syllabus say about you and your course? Again, that talks a lot about the tone of your course. We at Faculty Development uh, offer the service of looking at a course syllabus to give you some feedback. Um, it's probably a little late to do that for the spring semester. But we do look at syllabi um, during the semester to give you feedback on maybe some points that uh, would help you make the course a little more learner-centered, maybe make some changes, put in some graphics, maybe make it accessible, and so on. But I'm glad that you joined us today for this hour. I gave you a lot of information. As I mentioned, I'm going to be sending you this uh, link a little bit later this week.